Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, and it's a pleasure to follow the right honourable uh, gentleman. Um, and I agree with him entirely in terms of the importance of this Queen's speech and the importance of this Parliament. There is an enormous amount that this uh, Queen's speech portends for this Parliament, and the work that has now been given to us is uh, far-reaching and uh, so important that it necessarily will dominate much of our time and consideration in the months and years uh, ahead. I want to begin by joining with others who have spoken in paying tribute to the members who have sadly passed away in the past year, particularly Gerald Kaufman and, and Joe Cox. And I remember just over uh, a year ago um, speaking from the bench below on behalf of all the Northern Ireland members of Parliament, nationalist, unionist and independent. Um, at their request, and, and voicing our united and heartfelt horror uh-huh. at that terrible uh, event, uh, and repeating what so many people have said today, the need to uh, draw good out of such evil, and yeah. the tremendous example given by Joe Cox's family. Uh-huh. And uh, many of those good colleagues from Northern Ireland are no longer with us. They were in other parties. And I have already paid tribute to their contribution in this House. It is now the sad reality, and it is a sad reality, that uh, those members who are elected to represent the nationalist community in Northern Ireland do not take their seats. And it is sad, no matter what your, their views may be, and we disagree fundamentally on many issues, but I think it is sad on behalf of the electorate that they do not take their seats and uh, speak up for their constituents in this House. Uh, and we are very conscious of, of that. I want to welcome, uh, on our part, to these benches the two new members uh, yeah. from South Antrim and South Belfast who have uh, joined us uh, after an election which saw the DEP, perhaps uniquely among all the parties uh, in this House, uh, win uh, not only a majority in the area in which they stood, but with the greatest share of the vote ever in its history and the greatest number of members of Parliament. Yeah. However, Mr Deputy Speaker, the House does meet under the shadow of terrible uh, events and uh, lives lost, families destroyed, uh, communities devastated. And our hearts do go out to all those who have been bereaved in recent in, uh, incidents, to the injured, to all who have suffered and are suffering so terribly. Just before the election, many of us were here in this chamber on the day of the 22nd of March, when four innocent people were killed in Westminster Bridge, and PC Keith Palmer was murdered just yards from where we sit, dying to defend freedom and democracy. And little did we think then that uh, so soon terrorism would again inflict such horror across the country. We've had the awful Manchester Arena attack on the 22nd of May, followed by the attack on London Bridge in Borough Market on the 3rd of June. The horrific fire, Grenfell Tower, in the early hours of last Wednesday morning, which has seared into the consciousness of everyone everywhere, and now uh, another man murdered by the despicable terrorist attack near Finsbury Park Mosque. So these are indeed dark times for our nation. And yet, in the midst of such darkness and terror and pain and death, we have seen the love and sheer humanity of hundreds and thousands of people, of family, friends, neighbours, communities, coming together simply to help in any way that they can. We have witnessed the bravery and selfless courage of our emergency services, stretched beyond belief but dedicated to rescuing and helping others. What examples of love and compassion we have seen in recent days. And the terrible fire at Grenfell Tower must make us absolutely determined to do what is right by the families affected, take whatever steps are needed and as soon as possible to ensure that such a thing can never happen again and bring reassurance to people who live in such tower blocks. And the acts of terrorism highlight the threats that we face from a variety of sources, each with their own version of hate-filled ideology. And united, we can and will defeat the terrorists, just as in Northern Ireland. United, we have defeated the scourge of terrorism to a large extent. There are still challenges, of course, out there. But we have shown, I think, a way forward. 
Clearly combating the threats posed to innocent life, to our way of life, by terrorism, must be at the very top of the new government's agenda. There is no greater responsibility of government than the protection of the lives of its citizens and the security and the defence of the kingdom itself. We will, of course, on these benches, be clear in our support for measures that make people safer and our United Kingdom more secure. And we must always do right by those brave men and women of our security forces who put their lives on the line to protect and defend us. And that is why the commitment to the implementation of the Armed Forces Covenant throughout the United Kingdom, mentioned in the gracious speech today, is so important. And we look forward to working with the government to make that a reality across our land, and particularly in Northern Ireland, where there have been problems implementing it, and where there remains today a great tradition of service in Her Majesty's forces. We, of course, are a Unionist party, as is the Conservative and Unionist party. And I believe that the Labour Party, the vast bulk of its members, those who vote for it, are, are patriotic and believers in the United Kingdom as well. I warmly welcome the words in the gracious speech that a priority will be to build a more united country, strengthening the social, economic and cultural bonds between England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, strengthening the union, our precious union, as the Prime Minister has rightly called it, must be one of the overarching aims of this government. The case for the union is a positive one. It is one that finds increasing favour in Northern Ireland across the community divide, as illustrated by the recent opinion polls and recent surveys carried out. We will work with ministers to advance and deepen the ties that bind our constituent countries and regions together. And that approach will be needed as we face the greatest political and constitutional challenge of this Parliament, which other honourable and right honourable members have, of course, spoken of at great length, and that is the challenge of Brexit. The country as a whole has voted for Brexit, and this Parliament must now deliver it. Attempts to undermine or subvert the democratic decision made in the referendum would be catastrophic. We must get on and carry out the people's wishes. And I welcome the priority that has been given by both the United Kingdom government and by European Union negotiators to finding sensible outcomes to the challenges that face Northern Ireland and on the issue of the land frontier in particular with the Irish Republic. That shows, I believe, that despite all the rhetoric, people are up for finding sensible and pragmatic solutions. And of course, we've heard some debate today about membership of the single market and the customs union. And we've heard talk about special status for Northern Ireland within the European Union. Let me make it very clear that I believe that when people voted in the European Union referendum to leave the European Union, that they voted to leave the single market and the customs union. Hear, hear. And I believe that Northern Ireland must, along with the rest of the United Kingdom, do likewise. Hear, hear. We must not get into a situation where we have borders erected between the island of Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. To create borders between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom would be totally unacceptable. But we must be imaginative and flexible and pragmatic about ensuring that there is an open border, as frictionless as possible, between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. And there are ways, sensible ways, that have already been discussed about how that can be made to happen. And it is in the interests of the Irish Republic, and it is in the interests of the European Union, as well as in the interests of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland, to make that happen. And the great advantage that we start from is that everybody is saying that. There is nobody, apart, I have to say, from Sinn Féin who are calling for the special status within the EU for Northern Ireland, but that is not something that has been adopted or accepted by the new Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, or by any of the parties in the Irish Republic, or by the European Union negotiators. Everybody accepts that Northern Ireland's priorities in terms of the land frontier must be right at the top of the negotiating priority. I will indeed. I thank uh, my right hon. Friend for giving way and agree wholeheartedly that the, bu- that the um, border of course, must be frictionless between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Does he also accept that security considerations must not be set to the side with regards to our border? 
And is he alarmed, as I have been, by the recent reports from security analysts who say that there is now a worrying amount of radicalised individuals in the Republic of Ireland, and that poses challenges for our border? Well, the, the honourable gentleman raises a very, very important point, and one of the things that has been very welcome in recent years has been the very, very strong security relationship and working together between the Garda Shikana in the Irish Republic and the PSNI in Northern Ireland. And that cooperation is very strong and will continue. Uh, and indeed, recently, the PSNI Chief Constable made some remarks about how that cooperation can continue once we leave the European Union. Again, a pragmatic, sensible solution will be found to allow uh, matters to proceed in terms of jurisdictional issues uh, and all the rest of it. But how much stronger, Mr Deputy Speaker, would we be in terms of meeting the challenge of Brexit as far as Northern Ireland was concerned if we were able to get the Northern Ireland executive up and running as quickly as possible. Uh, and you know, if it isn't able to, if we can't restore the executive, then we will make sure in this House, working with ministers very, very closely, that Northern Ireland's voice is heard and our interests are protected. But we want in Northern Ireland that the inclusive government is back in being, and that everybody is involved in drawing up what happens together. That makes sense. That is that is the positive, sensible way forward. And it makes no sense for people to say, we're not going to take our seats at Westminster, and we've brought down the executive, and we're not going to get it up and running again, and then complain about what is happening. Uh, That is simply not logical. Um, So it is at a time of unprecedented change and challenge that it is vital that Northern Ireland has its assembly and executive working properly. Now, we did not collapse the executive. We did not walk out of the assembly. We could have last year when... Sinn Féin and the IRA were associated with the murder of a man in, in the markets area of Belfast. The Ulster Unionists walked out. We didn't. We stuck in there. We, we, we worked together to try to continue to make the devolved institutions work. Now, we want to make sure that the Assembly is up and running, and we have set no red lines or preconditions on that, because we believe that the challenges of Brexit, health, education, delivery of public services, the economy, these are far more important than the issues that divided. They are the people's priorities, and they should be the politicians as well. So the economic outlook for Northern Ireland would, of course, be much easier to predict predict with stable government in Belfast, and no doubt that goes for here as well. The electorate sent a very clear message to politicians about austerity at the election, and I think that it is very clear from since that election that people have to listen to what the people have said. I have to say I am very taken with the slogan which the Right Honourable Gentleman for Wokingham adopted for his election, prosperity, not austerity. I am glad that the uh, Chancellor said over the weekend that he was not deaf to what was being said. And for our part, on these benches, we again will work with government in the course of the next period in this Parliament to ensure that we do deliver prosperity, do deliver greater spending on health and education, and that we do see an end to the tunnel, the dark tunnel of austerity. So, Mr. Speaker, we are about strengthening the union. I am just coming to the end, so, and I know others want to get in. We are about strengthening the union, delivering Brexit, defending our country from threats of terrorism at home and abroad, creating prosperity and keeping Northern Ireland moving forward. And it is in the furtherance of those objectives that we will act and vote in this Parliament over the next five years. Yeah, yeah.